I did it. I want you to Jurassic World Dominion. Finally. So some of you might know that I recently moved to Japan. And unfortunately, Japan had it released in July. So I just like waiting here for a month, just like twiddling my thumbs while everyone else sort of watched the movie. But finally, July came around and I finally got to see Jurassic World Dominion. The movie that has got so much riding on it. It's the end of the Jurassic World franchise. It's got the old cast coming along. It's supposed to tie up a load of loose ends in the franchise, new and old. That's the Jurassic Park franchise and the Jurassic World franchise. So there was a lot riding on this. Oh dear. <laughs> A little history about this movie and the Jurassic fan base is that critics lambasted it and review bombed it to hell. So when it finally did come out and the Jurassic fans went to see it, they were all saying that the critics knew nothing and that if you were a true Jurassic Park fan, then you would like the movie. So what did I think of Jurassic World Dominion? Well, there's actually so much to unpack here that I think we just gotta kinda run through the movie and stop here and there and describe like why this works and more importantly, why the hell this doesn't work. But before we get into that, I wanna share some exciting news cause finally, T-Rex has been released! That plushie that you may have seen in the background of some videos is finally here and you can get it at the link in the description down below. Yes, I'll tell them, yes, mm hmm But there's only 3,000 of these and when they're gone, they're gone. When you buy one of these T-Rex plushies, not only do you get the plushie, but you also get a collective trading card. And again, of those, there's only 3,000 of them. He looks so cute when he's drinking his tea. But for the next few days, if you use code Tea Time, you can get 10% off your order. So not only have we made T-Rex plushies, but if you're missing out on some toast, we've made enamel pins of the bugger right there. And you can get those in the link in the description down below. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the video. We open up on a trawler ship in the middle of the ocean. Uh, notice how the text at the bottom is like the same text that they used in the original movies, like to show the locations. There's a lot of nods back to the old films and it's 100% deliberate and my God, it's gonna get old very quick. When suddenly the Mosasaur attacks the ship and capsizes it. Already two seconds into this film and we're getting the Mosasaur. That's pretty good, right? I can't wait to see it in the rest of the movie. It's not in the rest of the movie. <laughs> like, apart from an end scene at the end of the movie, what happened to the build-up at the end of Fallen Kingdom where it showed the Mosasaur, like, going to attack a surfer? Nothing happened with that. Colin, you retconned the lagoon in Fallen Kingdom to make it from landlocked to open to the ocean. And this is the payoff we get? It literally attacks one trawler ship and that's it? You could have had the entirety of the Fallen Kingdom opening with the Mosasaur attacking the helicopter and everything and attacking the submarine. You could have had that, but not have just like completely retconned the lagoon having it go into the ocean. It's also important that I establish very early on that I'm more of like the hardcore Jurassic Park fan than like a moviegoer who probably isn't going to pick up on a lot of the nuances of like past Jurassic movies and references that are in this one. So before it looks like I'm nitpicking, this is what I do. So I would probably be torn apart if I didn't at least notice these things. So please forgive me. So we transition from the boat scene to a news report, filling us in on what's happened from the last movie to this one. And that's something that like I don't understand with this movie. We go straight into this news report, which basically just acts as an exposition dump for anyone who maybe hasn't watched the other movies and needs to catch up. And this isn't the first time that like Jurassic World has done this. Fallen Kingdom started with a news report, like telling us that Mount Cyber was gonna explode and things needed to be done. A bit like they had the BBC in Fallen Kingdom. In this one, it's now this. The report doesn't feel legit, especially when they start to go into certain plot points that a news report wouldn't go into. There's a bit that introduces Dodson, who's the new CEO of Bio Biosyn, which is going to be like the main antagonist basically of this entire movie. But now Biosyn is basically the dinosaur company. Like everybody's forfeited the rights or the governments have forfeited the rights for Biosyn basically just to clean up and take care of the dinosaur mess, I think. At least really that's what it's hinted towards anyway. The news report also goes into detail about Maisie being a clone, which for me, I thought like that was completely top secret. Only a handful of people knew about Maisie being a clone in Lockwood Manor were killed. <laughs> 
So how does this news report know about it? It, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, they basically are just telling the audience that, like, remember, this is going to come back. Next, we're with Claire, Zia, and Franklin, I think it is. And they're breaking into some sort of black market Nazutoceratops breeding facility where the Nazutoceratops look very lifeless and dead. I, I mean, I know they're animatronics, but could we not have some movement? Maybe they've just given up on life. I don't know. So they end up stealing the baby Nazutoceratops, driving through like a herd of Cyanoceratops and stuff while they're being chased by the poachers. And then it's brought up about Owen. It's left sort of ambiguous. Like Zia and Franklin don't know if Claire and Owen are still together. And even Claire is sort of hesitant about it. Like, oh yeah, I don't know. And this makes literally no sense because the next time we see Claire and Owen together, they're hugging and kissing as if they were like been dating for years. So why is she acting like this? Oh, and then we cut to Owen. Oh boy, do we cut to Owen. Owen and some extras are chasing down a herd of Paris Rolifus. And it's obvious that they're having a callback to the Raptor motorbike scene, you know, that we built up in Jurassic World. And as stupid and as un earned as this entire scene is my stupid brain is like <laughs> yeah go get him <laughs> but in typical chris pratt fashion he manages to lasso a paris roller first he gets pulled off his horse and he somehow manages to tame it you know with the the owen grady pose like i get the raptors because he raised them from being young or at least with blue and blue is deliberately modified have a little bit of human emotion but here the power is like trapped it's got this guy who's coming really close to it and it's like yeah yeah i i guess you're, you're, oh you're you're owen grady oh why didn't you say so of course i'm gonna be tamed by you oh yeah also sorry like like, there's a bit with Maisie and she tells these lumber workers how to get rid of the apatosaurs from their construction site or something. But now the apatosaurs are absolutely ginormous. Uh, they definitely weren't this big in Jurassic World because we saw Owen sort of hold the head of one. But now they're like a titanic proportion. So apparently Maisie's not supposed to do this. She's supposed to stay out in the wilderness, you know, because if anybody sees her, they could kidnap her or something because she's a clone and has valuable genetic information or something. I don't know. That's what I find out later on. But at this point, it's kind of like, why are you just keeping her here? And later on, when Maisie brings this up to Owen, he basically just says, oh, we don't trust people and you can't have freedom. I'm adopted. My real parents couldn't possibly treat me. Then we see Blue, who's running around in the woods nearby. And surprise, she has a baby now. I can't wait to see how you die. Me too. And this new baby, who's named Beta, is apparently an exact copy of Blue. Now this, bear with me, is explained later by Dr. Wu, who says they used monitor lizard DNA to make Blue. And because of that, now Blue can do exactly the same thing. And it just feels so cheap. Like they could just say that anything was used in Blue because they've been so vague about it. Like Blue could have a second head and be like, oh, well, we used DNA of two-headed cobra to explain that away. And for that matter, like why does Blue have a baby now and not when she was left alone on Isla Nublar for like three years? And actually it's never really explained specifically why Dr. Wu needs Beta in order to reverse his mistake, which we'll find out later. It's just like, oh, well, it's cool to have Blue have a baby. Beta has no bearing on the plot apart from trying to get her back when she later gets kidnapped. Now, I'm not here to constantly berate the movie. Trust me, there are things I enjoy about it. Uh, the CGI on the Raptors, you know, it's not too bad. It can be a bit hit and miss depending on what sunlight is sort of there and the snow and stuff. Some shots of Beta look to be like an animatronic and they seem to be the strongest parts. And seeing Beta to just like run around the snows. It's cute, especially when she like falls down and gets back up again. It's adorable. Like we can't Ooh. say it's not. So I want you to have a guess. What do you think the main plot of this movie is? I mean, we've been building up dinosaurs in the wild. They're in our world now. What will we do? Well, actually, we don't care about that. There's locusts now, and we need to work out what to do with those. So these ginormous locusts that we see in the scene attacking the farm are going around the world. They're eating all of the crops, and this is going to lead to worldwide famine and the deaths of millions. It's just another, like, end of the world sort of plot that we've got going on, which really doesn't feel like that's the way this franchise was going. 
but it is now. And this is where we see Ellie for the first time wearing exactly the same clothes as she was wearing in the first movie. 30 years and she has still not changed her wardrobe. Flash forward into Utah where we see Alan Grant in like another dig zone sort of area. And then boom, before we know it, we've got the interaction with Alan and Ellie. And it, this whole thing just seems a little bit rushed to me. I want to see Alan Grant by himself before Colin tries to get Ellie and Alan back together. Because that's, let's be honest, that's basically the only reason that they're bringing these legacy characters back together. To rewrite the mistake that Jurassic Park 3 made with Mark. That's basically the only reason why Alan and Ellie are in this movie. Come on, let, let's be honest. We just want to see them together and be like, oh, okay, finally it's canon. And we can go to bed at night. Ellie Sadler is going to visit Biosyn and with an invite from Ian Malcolm, she wants Grant to be there too because she needs a witness to verify that these locusts are the same locusts that apparently are in Biosyn. And we also find out that Ellie is single because of course she's single. This is where this plot is going. And next we get a cameo, but not from a character or a dinosaur, but no, from like a video game. It's Jurassic World Evolution 2. Yeah, if you remember Jurassic Park is a callback to when she interacts interacted with the Triceratops in that movie. Remember? Yeah! <laughs> There's a lot of nice little details here, like how the Parasaur has a salt lick, a bit like a horse would. But we stay here for all of two seconds before the plot requires us to go somewhere else. In every Jurassic movie, there's a scene where the characters are sort of wowed by the dinosaurs. It started in Jurassic Park with the Brachiosaurus, and then in the sequel, The Lost World, there was a bit of a funny take on it. Oh yeah, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. But then later there's running and, and screaming. In Jurassic Park, it's warranted because we, the audience, like the characters, have never seen a dinosaur like this before. Remember, Jurassic Park was the first movie to put CGI dinosaurs on the screen to show them at scale and for it to look believable. But in Dominion, it's haphazardly broken up into like two parts. You have Ellie Sattler with an Ozudoceratops and then later on the helicopter, you have Alan Grant with the Dread Nortus. Ignoring all the consecutive movies, what does Dominion have to say about dinosaurs? Just a, here we go again feeling. We've seen this so many other times before and better. So why are we doing this again? Just because it's a Jurassic movie and it needs to happen? I don't know. It just comes off like a checklist. Like, oh, well, we need to have that scene. We need to have that scene. Oh, that's done. Oh, sweet. Great. Next scene. This whole scene could just be cut and it would make no difference to the plot or anything whatsoever. So we cut back to the Jurassic World cast, where after feeding Beta some toast... Could I have a James sandwich, please? Maisie gets kidnapped by someone who kind of looks like the caretaker in the last movie. And I know in the original script for Fallen Kingdom and there was a scene shot, Idris is supposed to have died from the Indoraptor, but because it wasn't in the extended edition or any sort of edition of the movie, uh, that's not canon. So Beta gets stolen... <laughs> ...and Blue gets bonked by a car off the side of a cliff. We also have a weird scene of Blue trying to climb up, like it's biting the camera. I can only think they added the scene in because it's similar to that part in Jurassic Park where the raptor almost bites Lex when she's trying to escape. But in that scene, it makes sense because she could be attacked by the raptor and bitten by it. But here, Blue's just biting at the air, like... Okay. So there's basically a lot of things in this movie that are only in it to reference to old movies. And this is one of them. Like surely we could have got a better shot of it, except for, no, we couldn't because we had to replicate the exact same camera angle as the first movie. So Blue isn't very happy about this situation and tells Claire and Owen that they're bad parents and to go find a baby. So they end up calling Franklin. An interesting thing to note here, now that concept art is floating around the internet, we can see that Lowry was supposed to come back for this scene, but shooting schedule didn't line up and basically we got Franklin instead. So the locusts are now devouring all the crops in the entire Midwest and everyone, or at least this guy, seems to not even be bothered about it. He's like, ah, we're gonna die in three days. So, I mean, that shows that we should, as an audience, also not care about it as well. <laughs> okay. We also get shown that some of the characters that either they didn't want back or didn't want to pay or didn't have free time are also doing other things. I guess tying up those loose ends from Jurassic Park. Oh, look, it's Barry. Or should I say Berry? My all-time favorite character, Berry. I love Berry. How could you get his name wrong? And after that, we cut back to Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler, who are introducing us to the new character, Ramsey. I think the actor does a great job playing the character. The only problem is that the... 
I feel like this movie didn't really need him to be here. I, I'm just going to go on a limb and say it. He basically just defeats Ian Malcolm's purpose of being there at all. He couldn't he have just invited them? I don't know. Now it's time for exposition dump number two. Basically, all the dinosaurs from Nublar and Isla Sauna are here. You know, the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park 2 and Jurassic Park 3. There's also an ABS system, which basically keeps all the pteranodons in the valley. And not only are all the dinosaurs from those islands here, but they've got neural brain implants, which basically allow Biosyn to remotely control them. What? You can rejoice, his Camp Cretaceous fans. Something from that Netflix series made it into the final movie, and it makes just as little sense as it did in there. It's not explained in that show, it's not explained in this movie, and to be fair, even in Camp Cretaceous, they sort of told the dinosaurs where to go because they had drones sort of maybe emitting a frequency or something and actually like herding them. That made more sense than a bloody brain implant. Also, Ramsey just drops the bombshell like, oh yeah, by the way, Rex is here, it took three years to capture her. Grant and Ellie both react to this statement, and this is where I'm thinking that Ramsey is gonna say something about the histories, you know, like, you guys barely survived the first part. But no, he's just like, huh, it arrived just before you guys. Why Colin is wasting these opportunities? <laughs> like, he's really cherry picking what parts to, like, develop some of the characters and what parts, like, oh, well, you know, we've, we've got to get somewhere. We've got to get more glamour shots of the helicopter going through the Dolomites. Because apparently, every other Jurassic movie has some sort of flying vehicle flying through hills. So we need that here, too. Again, another thing on the list. Ah, <laughs> flying helicopter scene. Sweet, done. We also hear that there is a new apex in the valley, and that being the Giganotosaurus. And boy, do they build this thing up. Giganotosaurus, largest known terrestrial carnivore. Giganotosaurus, biggest carnivore the world has ever seen. What? What the? Strangely enough, they have this fascination with everyone getting the dinosaur's name wrong or the type of dinosaur it is wrong and someone having to correct them. Allosaurus. Again, I have no idea why this is here other than a callback to Jurassic Park 3 where everyone got the Spinosaur wrong and called it like a Suchomimus. It's a Tyrannosaurus. I don't think so. It sounds... <laughs> So we've had the Giga built up in trailers, in artwork for such a long time, and now we're watching the movie, and how do we think we're gonna introduce Giga into the movie? Well, let's have a look at examples, like previous things. What about Jurassic Park? You know, the T-Rex, they go on a tour, they go to the T-Rex exhibit, but it's not there. It's only later on in the movie, like halfway through the movie, when during a storm, you kind of see the T-Rex, but it's dark and it's terrifying because it's just killed something. So, with all that being said, how would you think they showed the Giga? Oh, literally two seconds after saying they have a Giga, and they show it in broad daylight. And Colin went on record calling the Giga the Joker. I gotta admit, I've never seen the Joker look so peaceful before. Uh... After landing at Biosyn, we get an introduction to Dodgson. <laughs> Something about Dodgson that is very strange is he's always eating. The only reason I can think of having this character always eat is because he's the weird locust bug man. I thought this was a clever way to kind of tie the two things together. However, later on in the movie, we see Ian and Malcolm eating. So there goes that theory, I suppose. And again, just like when Dodson eats, the audio for like the Foley is so loud. Wanna get out of here? I feel like this wasn't even scripted because the way the actors react to Dodson asking for food just seems so legit. Do you have food? Like one of my bars, Harden? Um... Ah, that's one of Colin's amazing directorial choices. I'll not tell them this character likes to eat and then I'll have them sporadically eat during the movie, making everybody confused. It's genius. <laughs> There is a nice little bit of character storytelling here where they have to take a picture with Dodson and Alan Grant kind of shies away from it. And that's not just like interesting because, well, you know, it's Alan Grant and he's actually doing something in a scene for once. Last time we saw Alan Grant was in Jurassic Park 3 and he was kind of fine to be in front of a lecture room of students and just ask questions. So it's like, oh, what kind of happened to him between those times? But it lasts for all of two seconds and we're on to the next thing. And brace yourselves because we've got 
called the one and only Jeff Gold. And this feels like the Ian Malcolm we've come to know from Jurassic Park and The Lost World. I Maybe this is a hot take, but it's my own personal opinion. Jeff can't play Ian as easy as he used to be able to. I don't know if it's directing or if it's just them letting him do what he does best, and that's be Jeff. But the Ian Malcolm character sometimes slips back into Jeff. And I think that they would just want to play Ian up for comic relief. But it's it's quite obvious when it happens. Because straight after the lecture scene, you see Ian Malcolm signing copies of his book. Which isn't something that Ian would do, but it is 100% something Jeff would do. At the start of The Lost World, we saw what fame kind of did to Ian. And it exposed him as being this, like, weirdo. And everyone looked at him a bit funny. Contrasting that with how he is now, it doesn't feel like the same. Remember in the first movie, when Ian and Alan had that conversation about how many wives and kids Ian had and Alan had none? Get any kids. Me? Oh, oh, hell yeah, three. I love kids. Yeah, they do that again here. You have any family or? No! Honestly, I could be here all day and harp on about Easter eggs, so I'm gonna try and control myself just a little bit. Saying that, the way they walk down the stairs is reminiscent of the way they walked up the stairs in Jurassic Park, showing that actually they're coming down stairs. And the next scene is actually one of my favorites, not because it has loads of action and there's lots of dinosaurs, but it's just characters interacting with each other. Ian takes Ellie aside and tells that he does know exactly what's going on with the locusts. We have this sort of moment of, oh, actually Ian does know what he's doing and it's kind of cool. The comedy works here because the characters are acting in ways that we expect them to. Alan Grant is out of touch with the modern world and technology again, and Ian has a plan. Also, remember when Ian and Ellie had like a little bit of flirting? It happens again this time. <laughs> and this is where we learn that the locust had nothing to do with Dodson. In fact, they were Henry Wu's little side project that went skew with. And now he needs Maisie's DNA in order to fix the issue. And the annoying thing about Dodson is that we learn nothing of his motivations. I know it's explored a little bit in Jurassic World Evolution 2. We are leaving InGen in our dust. Where he feels like he's got a chip on his shoulder about John Hammond and Jurassic Park and how he wants to have things that that didn't have. But really, even there, it's just surface level. So, on to Malta. Malta, hands down, is probably the most fun in this movie and probably has the best scenes. Just because of the action and the dino ring scene, it's just loads of fun to explore. It's what we kind of want to see, right? You want to see stuff like this. You want to see new things. And this is exactly what it is. Claire and Owen meet up with Barry. I mean, Barry. And this is where we get introduced to two new characters. The pilot who transported Beta to Malta, Kyla Watts, and the head of the dinosaur smuggling side for Biosyn, Soyona Santos. And more importantly, the whole interrupted plot from the last movie is here. You know how you could point a laser at your target, click it and make a noise, and then the interrupted would go and attack the thing? You know, something where you would normally just point a thing and shoot? But this time, there's an extra step involved where the Indoraptor has to go kill it. Yeah, that thing, that's here. And trust me, it's just as pointless as it was in Fallen Kingdom. And the new dinosaur is these Atrociraptors, which apparently are bred. They're not engineered, apparently. That's how they do it. And with all this buildup and having a prior movie showing how amazing this application should be, uh, I think only one Atrociraptor actually manages to kill someone. The rest just kind of don't do anything and they're terribly inept. Oh, and remember that scene in Jurassic World where Barry's being attacked by Blue and he's like confined and, and stuck? Yeah, that happens again with Barry. Cool. Oh, and remember that scene in Jurassic World where Owen rides a motorbike with the raptors? Well, it's here again, except for now, the raptors are the bad guys. Seeing the smuggler ring get overrun by dinosaurs is fun. It, like, it's stupid fun. It's what I was expecting from Jurassic World. Again, this could be just my stupid brain telling me how cool it is and just, just forget everything else. Claire learns that Biosyn are behind the capture of Maisie and Beta. Barry learns how to dive roll. And more importantly, even when an Atrociraptor is in its perfect environment, it's had its target right next to it, it can't even catch up with a civilian. Showing just how stupid this idea really was. Realistically, the raptor probably should have caught up to her in two seconds, but you know, we can't have anyone die in this movie. That would be stupid. Imagine having the audience think something's gonna happen to our main characters. God. Duh. Dr. Wu explains that Maisie wasn't actually created by a grandfather. Like a fallen kingdom made you believe, 
but actually Charlotte, her original self. So apparently Charlotte wanted a child, so she cloned herself, which already is a can of worms and why if you wanted a child, would you even try to clone yourself? But anyway, after the clone baby was born, she found out that she herself had a disease. So she ended up changing her clone self, Maisie's DNA, in order to get rid of the disease by adding a pathogen, which would attack all the cells and replace it. And that would let Maisie live a full life, the life that she couldn't have. But then why didn't she change her own DNA if she's 100% identical to her clone? But you very clearly see that she injects the clone with, you know, the pathogen in order to cure her. So why couldn't she just do it herself? The only explanation I can think of is that she's already too far gone and the pathogen wouldn't work on her. The movie doesn't explicitly say that's the reason as to why she's died. It's just, it's a weird plot, man. It, it's really weird. It's not Jurassic at all, let's be honest. That all aside, why is Maisie okay with her cloning herself? That's not a normal thing that people do. Also, if Maisie didn't exist, how is Dr. Wu even going to stop the locusts? Aha, blood, that's why. Anyway, back to the locusts. So Ellie Sattler and Alan Grant end up going into the place where there's all the locusts and getting the DNA in order to show that, you know, these are the same locusts. But in doing so, the locusts sort of start flying around and it, they kind of start to do this before the alarm even goes off. Now, pay close attention to how many locusts are actually in this shot because, trust me, it's going to become important later. After Dr. Dr. Wu tells Maisie that he needs her DNA in order to basically save the world. Maisie pieces out and releases Beta? Where were you going, Maisie? The world's gonna be destroyed. As luck would have it, Maisie bumps into Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler. Save it for the end, you two! Owen, Claire, and Kayla are in the plane. They're entering the valley, and Dodgson somehow knows or learns that actually it's the parents of the girl that are in the plane, so he ends up turning off the ABS system and alerting, like, all of the Tyrandons to come and attack it. And basically within two seconds, like a bloody trained eagle, the Quetzalcoatlus comes and attacks the plane. Most of the dinosaurs in this movie have terrible build-up and anticipation, but the Quetzal kind of has it, although it's kind of spoiled because they have, like, a psych-out of saying, Oh, we're fine! Okay, it's cool, we're good. <laughs> plane goes down, there's only one parachute, Claire pulls a parachute, she uh, gets attacked by Pteranodons, which I can only assume is uh, revenge for what she did to the Dimorphodon in Jurassic World. <laughs> Ramsey meets up with Ellie and Grant and reveals that actually Ian was just a pawn in this, and it was Ramsey who's the brains of the scheme to expose Dodgson and the Locust plot, undoing all the character of Ian Malcolm. Sweet. Also, he just lets Maisie go. Surely he knows how important she is to Dr. Wu and ending the locust plague we've got going, right? So he just lets them go, of course. Bye, have a beautiful time. And now it's time for my second favorite scene in the entire movie, the Therizinosaurus scene. The introduction to the Therry is actually really good here. The music as well with this scene is so weird and unsettling, it just works. How However, this movie does love to throw dinosaurs at you without any buildup. Like literally two seconds after we hear the Therizinosaurus's call, it's like right there in front of us and again in broad daylight. There was some concept art of this scene floating around and it looked so much better. Like hiding the Therizinosaurus through the parachute would have been such a better buildup than what we got. Or better yet, why not have it shrouded in fog and just seeing this massive silhouette right next to her and it would make the deer killing scene much better. What just happened to that deer? Why does it have claws? This isn't a dinosaur we've seen before. It would have been so good. Jurassic World got this right and this is the same director. Like Indominus Rex, wasn't shown the first time we see it. All we know is that this thing is terrifying and it's like incredibly intelligent. I mean, if we're going to constantly reference other Jurassic movies, why don't we reference one of the most iconic scenes from Jurassic Park 3, the Pteranodon appearing through the fog. That's just stuck with me since then, and I'm pretty sure loads of other people have taken that away with it too. So when Claire's going to the water, why don't finally then show it coming out of the fog? That would look so good. Honestly, that all aside, I can't complain too much about the scene. It works really well. <laughs> and would you believe Kayla and Owen actually survived the plane crash? It's like no one who's a main character is in any peril throughout the entire movie. But wait, there's a pyroraptor. And I'm just so confused. Like, isn't this a dam? This is a place where people are supposed to be working. 
Why is there a dinosaur here? And with the plane sinking and the ice cracking, the Power Raptor dives into the frozen water to the loudest horror bang I've heard in a while. <laughs> Colin's like, the audience can't question it if they're scared. Just like, put a giant horror bang in it, yeah. It swim. Oh, and fall in water. Not even trying to take into consideration this is a dam and there's probably going to be water flow in there. And Owen manages to make it out. Because if this man has managed to survive a pyroclastic freaking flow from a volcano, a little bit of freezing hypothermic water is not a problem. So he's a freaking superhero at this point. Like, there's no way you can make me believe otherwise. Oh yeah, then Jump Scare Raptor appears again. Hello there. And then we get like this random scream from Kayla, which is just like, oh, we need to make this scene funny let's have a scream ha <laughs> but it's not a scream that's genuine it's a scream that's put in there for comedic effect a bit like in fallen kingdom with franklin <laughs> You didn't work with Franklin. It was weird. And here it's even weirder. So we cut back to Ellie and Alan Grant, like in the Hyperloop, and that dastardly <laughs> Dodgson cuts off the power, leaving them stranded in an amber mine. There's also a shot of a sail weirdly gliding effortlessly through the water. What the f what is that? <laughs> and you cannot convince me otherwise that this only exists to be a throwback to Jurassic Park 3 with this Spinosaur sale. And it's only in here to try and get Jurassic fans excited about seeing a Spinosaur. That's it. It serves no purpose other than that. And after Dodson finds out that Ian's behind all this, what does he do? He fires him. And after firing Ian Malcolm, he just lets him rant to his face and call him, you rapacious rat. <laughs> oh, by the way, this is the same guy that's authorized the death of Owen and Claire on multiple occasions. Oh yeah, also Owen and Kayla have stumbled across the T-Rex. And would you believe Rexy actually is acting like an animal here? And then the Giga shows up. And my god, does it look like an edgy teenager designed this thing. All that's missing is Linkin Park playing in the background. The two of them have a tutorial dispute over the deer, and then the T-Rex walks off. And I really like this. Not every interaction between apex carnivores would end in dying. That's not what they want to do. Animals in real life don't attack each other if they don't have to. And it's nice to actually see that portrayed here with dinosaurs. You know what? I'll give him a point for that. That was, that was really nice. So Ian sets off to rendezvous with Alan and the gang once they exit the amber mines. But shock horror, they're not alone. <laughs> So you're telling me that in the last scene, it was actually a Dimetrodon that was blowing bubbles in the water? What? It's also at this point when I first watched the movie that I realized that none of the main characters are in trouble. You can show me a Dimetrodon biting at the heels of Alan Grant, but you can't fool me that he's going to be injured at all. At this point, you've heard characters chased by Atrociraptors in a plane crash, submerged in freezing cold water, dodging Therizinosauruses. So all of this suspense, all of this tension is wasted. I know, as well as the audience at this point know, that nothing's going to happen. You can't tell me now they're going to be killed by a Dimetrodon. Oh, but there is one casualty. Uh, Alan Grant's hat. Get hat. You have any idea what Billy went through to get that thing? There's only about a third left of this movie at this point, but my god, some of the most egregious things happen in this final third of the movie. I didn't know there was going to be a code. So how would you think they get out of here? You can't just have Ramsey randomly find them on a camera and put in the... Oh, wait, no, you can. Again, taking away from any merit that Ian Malcolm might have had. And speaking of achievements, now we have the scene where I thought the Giga was going to die, and I was wrong. I thought it was going to die in this scene due to the promo and the rest of the merchandise. Don't tell me Giga gets pushed underneath this. Claire hits the button and crushes it. The Giganotosaurus doesn't die here. No, a different dinosaur dies here. One that arguably is a lot worse. So I'm going to put you in the perspective of a Jurassic Park fan, just in case you want. The Dilophosaurus has only been in the first Jurassic Park film, and it was so memorable that every film afterwards has had merchandise or toys of Dilophosaurus in it, even though Dilophosaurus has never featured in it. It did have a holographic cameo in Jurassic World, but we'll not count that one. And with 30 years of speculating and wondering just how the Dilophosaurus will make its grand debut, 
you again. Pretty much no matter what they did in Dominion, it would never live up to the hype. However, the way it appears in this movie, who couldn't be further from the way we wanted it. This was not what I was expecting. Why is the initial shot of the Dilophosaurus like so far away and it looks motionless? Just like the introduction to all the other dinosaurs in this movie. It's just like there and you can see it and there's no secret and there's no build up or anything. And as Claire like tries to climb up the ladder, we get subsequent shot after subsequent shot of weird stilted and wooden looking Dilophosauruses that look really tiny in the shot shot and don't look imposing at all or threatening. Also, why does it sound like a creaky door? What did you do in the sound design? Did you slow its normal noise down? What happened? I don't know who was in charge of cinematography, but these shots do Dilophosaurus no justice. There's a part where Claire is like confronted by a Dilophosaur and for some reason she scoots down to meet its eye level for what it can only assume is to get the next shot of the frill coming out face to face with Claire. <laughs> Oh dear, how is Claire gonna get out of this situation? I'm not kidding. When I say you have to see it, to believe it. <laughs> what just happened? Oh, harder, Daddy. I'm not even kidding. When I first saw this, I thought this was a blooper. I, I was I actually looked around the cinema to see if anybody else was laughing at this point. I don't know who wrote this. I don't know who read it and green lit it, but my god, this is butchered. <laughs> there's jumping the shark and then there's freaking strangling the Dilophosaurus. But don't worry, guys, that's not the last time we're going to see Dilophosaurus. You might be wondering, what happened to all the other Dilophosauruses that were around? Or was it just one? Well, it was more, but they had to go away. They had to go to be in a later <coughs> scene in the movie, so they had to skedaddle. Next, we cut to Dodson looking at the locust chamber, where they're all still swarming like an angry swarm of locusts. Yeah, I don't have anything for that. So you're telling me that Dodson had this whole thing in place to burn them and kill them all, but didn't have a way to calm them down? Like what? Anyway, Dodson puts them on fire. They start swarming like crazy and they burst out the chamber because I don't know, when they're on fire, they have more strength. And you remember when I said to keep an eye on how many locusts there were here? Oh yeah, now there's like thousands of them and they're flying all over the valley, setting it on fire. We also have another like forced comic relief bit. The truck that Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler and all of them are in is teetering over the edge of some sort of cliff. It does stop rocking. And then somebody says, oh, I'm glad that's over. And then the, the Jeep just like falls off. Horrible, it's forced. It's been done to death a million times. I just don't know why it's there. But luckily they rendezvous with Owen and Claire and Kayla. So the whole cast is together and right on cue, the Giga approaches. So what does the Giga do, you might wonder? The biggest apex carnival the world has ever seen and a whole bunch of people out in the open? What do you think the Giga does? Remember how the T-Rex in the first movie was like beside the car and it didn't do anything and it just moved it around? Yeah, yeah, the Giga does that here. And for some reason, it chases them around the Jeep really slowly. It can quite clearly see them. I don't know why the movie's trying to make me believe that it can't see them. They all manage to get up onto the observation platform, you know, to be a nice biting height for the Giganotosaurus. Whee! Except for Ian Malcolm and, oh no, oh no! 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 And apparently, according to Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum would approach Colin Trevorrow with 50 new ideas every day, which apparently drove them all insane. And something tells me that Jeff had a part to play in this scene right here. I get that this is a redemption for Ian Malcolm's character, because in the first one, he just kind of had the flair to be all macho hero. But in this one, he's sort of, you know, maybe kind of sacrificing himself in order to buy time for them to get into the platform. But then like a bloody Tom and Jerry cartoon, Jeff Jeff throws the spear into the Giga's mouth. <laughs> you do have like a scene where Alan Grant kind of saves him after he slips, which is, I guess, supposed to be Alan Grant forgiving him? I wouldn't care. Nothing happens because of this scene. He ends up with them anyway. Also, Claire tells them to run, even though they're already running straight towards her. And it's only in here because Claire says run in every other Jurassic World movie. And it's just so still here? Uh... Anyway, they get inside the platform. Owen utters like a terrible cringy one-liner that basically 
forces the Giga to attack them. I'm not even kidding when I say this. Owen starts shanking the Giganotosaurus. I, I don't even- I can't, I can't even run out of things to say at this point. Then Claire comes in and tases it in the eye. Like, this poor dinosaur, man. But the whole scene comes off as, like, a little bit awkward and, like, one of those shows where actors have to interact with an animatronic because some of the shots show the animatronic staying still and it kind of has to because if it moves around, it might actually injure somebody. Humiliated, obviously, the Giga decides that being in this movie was a terrible idea and leaves the scene. And because the valley's now on fire, apparently they have to call an evacuation, which apparently means that Biosyn's over and that's the end, judging by Dodgson's reaction to it. God. I don't know why he throws this fit. The movie wants to tell me that that's it. He's he's done. He's over. But you have these brain implant chips for this reason, right? Like, what what's the problem? They end up having to herd all the dinosaurs into this tiny little courtyard. I and mean, we've seen this courtyard in previous scenes. There's no way you can get all the dinosaurs in here. Multiple sauropods and big apex carnivores. And they're supposed to fit in here? What are you doing? So the crew devise a plan to escape the island by turning the ABS system back on. And uh, I just, at this point, I'm like, I'm done. I just want them off the island and to have some sort of climax. Oh, look, it's the cryocan from the first movie. Remember that? Yeah, remember the scene in Jurassic Park where Ellie had to go and turn the power back on? Yeah, then we do it again here, except for we also have Claire and we have Ian Malcolm on the walkie-talkies again, giving like the wrong information and it's all like, oh, Ian, you're so stupid. And we also have a little scene with Alan Grant, Owen Grady and Maisie recapturing Beta. And it's kind of meh. I mean, there's a little bit of music to show that maybe Alan Grant is conquering his fear or something. It was, he's also doing the Owen Grady pose. But at the same time, it's kind of just like, what? why is this music playing here? This is where Owen and Alan were supposed to come face to face with the Pyroraptor. Which is such a shame because apart from finally getting together with Ellie at the end of the movie... This is all that Alan does. Since Jurassic Park, Alan Grant has been obsessed with velociraptors. He's been studying them, researching them, even giving lectures on them. And there's a point in that lecture where Alan Grant says this. Dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. What is left of them is fossilized in the rocks. And it is in the rock that real scientists make real discoveries. Which then goes great with his introduction in Dominion. Science is about the truth truth in these rocks. If only there was a company making genetically perfect dinosaurs. Oh wait. We've brought back numerous species in their purest form and I mean complete untouched genomes. And if only Alan Grant had managed to encounter one of those genetically perfect dinosaurs like the Pyroraptor, it would have wrapped up his whole narrative. And because he doesn't, Alan Grant's arc is never realized. All the research, all the studying he's done in the previous movies is just wasted. And before you say it, this doesn't count. I'm not going to believe that all of Alan Grant's hard work led to this tiny little moment. And in the same lecture, Alan Grant brings up this point. Now what John Hammond and InGen did at Jurassic Park is create genetically engineered theme park monsters, nothing more and nothing less. These monsters are exactly what Owen Grady has experience with. So not only would you bring Alan Grant's story to a satisfying closure, you could also have Alan Grant give information to Owen about how to deal with these dinosaurs and vice versa. But instead, it's only Owen that helps Alan, teaching him the classic Owen Grady pose. You know, the one that works on not only raptors, but every other dinosaur in the entire franchise. So in the end, what is the moral of Alan Grant's story? Well, if you get too involved in your career, it goes nowhere and life passes you by. Until you finally give it up and you get a life. Or in this case, Ellie Sattler. And let's be honest, we all knew going into this, we were going to get this ending. Alan Grant was going to be with Ellie Sattler. But I just wanted more. This Pyroraptor scene could have been it. It took us five movies to get us to an ending that the first movie gave us, and if I'm gonna be honest, in a way better way that was more subtle and just nicer. And after 30 years of coming up with this ending for Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler, Ellie, yeah. I am coming with you. A reference back to the start of the movie. Oh my God, it's references oh, all around. All his research and all the time he's put into this didn't amount to anything in the end. And I think that's what stings about this. If this wasn't the final movie in the franchise, I don't think I would be this cut up about it. And unfortunately, this is it. This is probably gonna be the last time we see Alan Grant.
or at least to my knowledge anyway. Right, so they've recaptured Beta, they've got the power back on, but first they had to turn it off and oh no, Dodson was in the Hyperloop and now he's like stuck. Even though our characters were in the Hyperloop like two seconds ago, there surely can't be any dinosaurs. Oh no, there's dinosaurs down here, isn't there? Yeah, okay. And not just any dinosaurs. No, it's freaking Dilophosaurus. As cruel fate would have it, just as Dennis Nedry died of the hands of the Dilophosaurus, uh, Dodgen's also gonna meet the same end, apparently. And on paper, this sounds kind of fitting, right? Because it was his fault he died through Dilophosaurus, so Dodgen's gotta meet his end the same way. But in execution, it leaves a lot to be desired. Like, a lot. When I first saw this scene, I was thinking, oh, well, actually, maybe he's just gonna be crushed by the Hyperloop. You know, like, the power has to come back on, and he's outside on the track, and the Hyperloop just, like, starts going. The death isn't the worst, but the Dilophosaurs, again, are just so rigid. Which is such a shame, because there is some behind-the-scenes footage that shows they had a working Dilophosaur. Like, an animatronic that would walk and move and everything. And they just didn't use it for whatever reason. So now we're just left with a scene where Dilophosaurs spit on them and stand over him awkwardly. And it's made worse with the fact that Dodgson tries to start a conversation with them. He's like, so what's yours? <laughs> like, I get it, it's the character, but at the same time, really? We're gonna have the, him die like that? Okay. Oh yeah, and then Dr. Wu, like, appears and reiterates to Maisie, like, he needs her DNA to correct the problem. But this time, Maisie's like, oh, okay, the plots allow me to say yes this time, so I'll say yes. Just, you know, millions of people starving to death is a trivial matter. Yeah. But to be fair, none of the new cast, like the Jurassic World cast, know about this plotline at all. It's only the legacy characters. And even then, it's like, does Maisie really know the extent of this locust problem? But she's gonna be like, you know what? Charlotte would want it, so I guess we'll do it. But now we're on to the climax of the movie. With the anti-air system whatever back on, Kayla is able to fly the helicopter and land in the courtyard. But wait, it's filled with dinosaurs, in it? Well, yes and no, actually. <sighs> so all the dinosaurs from the valley are in this tiny little courtyard. But apparently this place is magical because the dinosaurs only appear when they're needed. What's that? The dreadnoughts is there? Yeah, it's there for a second and then it's gone. Oh, the T-Rex appears? Oh, the, the Giga appears? Oh, and the Therizinosaurus appears? None of them were just there to begin with. No, they had to appear when the plot required them. It's bloody Harry Potter and the Room of Requirement. The Courtyard of Requirement, really. So anyway, Rexy enters the scene and it's just such a promo shot. And then of course the Giga shows up and this is this the way it's supposed to be. We're gonna have a final battle and just like in Jurassic Park 3 where you had the Spinosaurus or attacking the T-Rex and the humans were caught in the middle. This is actually worse than that scene. Because in Jurassic Park 3, the characters ran out of the way and then we just got some really cool shots of watching dinosaurs fight. Whereas in Dominion, you don't get that. You get shaky camera where you can kind of barely see what's going on with the fight while you follow the characters go from one X to the other X and then someone falls I'm over falling. and they spend ages trying to pick them up. I know nothing's gonna happen to the cast, so can I not just watch a freaking good dinosaur fight down? Damn it. We had Jeff Goldblum two seconds ago have a spear on fire and throw it into the Giga's throat. Nothing is going to happen yet. It tries, it honestly tries to make it seem like something's gonna happen, but you know it's not. So before you know it, like Rexy's defeated because, you know, Rexy always has to be defeated. We're now ripping off Jurassic World, that whole scene when Indominus has Rexy on the floor, except for this time Rexy looks dead. In Jurassic World, Rexy had some signs of life, but in this one, no, it's flatlined. Like there's no sign of life there whatsoever. So you think, oh, wow, okay, Rexy's actually died. That's interesting. And like a freaking Dragon Ball Z character that's Ada Senzu Bean, Rexy comes straight back to life. And it's not like, oh, like, oh, it tries to struggle after the whole fight to get up. No, no, no. This is like 100% like strength, like straight back up and ready to fight again. Rexy then headbutts the Giga into the Therizinosaurus and impales it. And that's it. That's how it ends. Just like that. This Giga got such an unceremonious death and it was completely unwarranted. There was no reason to kill it. After everything, this is it. This is the big climax. And I know in the extended cut, when it's zooming into the T-Rex's eye, it's supposed to flash back to like 65 million years ago, which was the original fight that killed Rexy. But you wouldn't know that unless you watch the prologue on Jurassic World's own YouTube channel. And even considering that, 
Did you catch it? You see the trees pop up for like two seconds? It's like they kind of had an idea of what to do. It's like, oh, well, Rex, you'll get the revenge. But they just didn't know how to expand on that or even how to show that Rex remembered. Oh, wait, I died back then. I'll get up and get my revenge. I had to pause this to even realize that they switched out Rexy's model with its old one because there's like a tiny bit of fluff in it, but you don't even see it because it's completely in darkness. You could have had the prologue at the start of the movie and then called back to it here or even during the fight between Rexy and T-Rex, have it flash back to the past and then to the present. It would have made this fight personal. It would have given this fight meaning. And you can't lie, how cool would it have been to have had the final fight in the Jurassic franchise be a rematch grudge match of sorts of the one that started it all. But instead of that, we get a WWE tag team. All that's missing is the chair. Watch out, watch out. After this fight happens and near the end of the movie when they're sort of doing a voiceover and showing dinosaurs in the wild, they show the buck and the doe T-Rex from the Lost World in the Biosyn Valley with Rexy. So while this whole fight's going on, why didn't these Rexes like help out? With that being said, the whole time this battle's going on, I'm just thinking of Jurassic World and just how much better the final battle is there because the Indominus Rex's death is warranted to an extent. It's gone around, it's killed people, it's killed dinosaurs for no other reason that it just wanted to. So the fact that we get to see Rexy and Blue and eventually Mosasaur sort of team up to take on this hybrid abomination makes sense. But here, Giga let Rexy live, and now all of a sudden, now because they're in an enclosed space, they have to kill each other. And then we're supposed to just believe that Rexy and the Therizinosaurus, they teamed up and shook hands, and then they just went their separate ways after this? Like, really? <laughs> Oh my god. This whole final battle, this whole final sequence, it's devoid of merit, it's devoid of reason, and it is completely devoid of logic. Hey, Ellie and Alan finally got together. Yay! Was it worth sitting through the entire movie? Not really. Dr. Wu gets to release his genetically modified locust into the wild to kill all the others, and what's the payoff for genetic modification? Nothing. Apparently you can do it with no consequence, which goes completely against the logic of Jurassic Park in the first place. But you know what? It needs a happy ending and Dr. Wu kind of gets his redemption arc. They bring Beta back to Blue and Blue is apparently fine with this. Uh, I don't know. I would have thought Blue would have been like... <coughs> and Maisie goes back to live in isolation because there will always be another evil big bad company looking to steal her and use her DNA for God knows what. Yay! The movie ended pretty much exactly the way it started and didn't really resolve much. We just found out about Maisie and now Biosyn's no more. And let's not even talk about how criminally underused the Mosasaur was. Like, what was that? I don't think Jurassic World Dominion really is a bad movie. It's got its flaws, yes, but I don't think those flaws mean that it's fundamentally flawed. The Malta scene, that whole thing was amazing. I enjoyed that so much. The Therizinosaurus scene was good as well. Seeing the legacy characters, albeit not the way I kind of wanted to see them. He slid into my DMs. Oh, wow! That is relatable! Was nice too. Jeff's always a pleasure to watch. And can we just give credit to the Therizinosaurus and the Giga kind of just acting like dinosaurs? Oh, animals for the first time, I think, in a long time. At least we got to see that, I suppose. In the end, my gripe with this is that it doesn't feel like a Jurassic movie. It just feels like one of those Hollywood blockbuster movies with dinosaurs chucked in. And that's kind of the way that Jurassic World has felt for a long time now. It wanted to try and do so much, but in the end, it just didn't give enough time to anything. And that's saying something. This was like a really long movie. Did Owen Grady even get a paragraph? And for that matter, did Grant? Jurassic World, if I'm honest, feels like a fluke. It feels like they didn't expect it to do as well as it did. And that was kind of obvious from all the merchandise and everything. There was no push for it. There was no follow-up. And it feels like they've just been laying down the track as they go, just trying to stitch together any sort of plot that makes sense. When Jurassic World first came out, I heard someone refer to it as a popcorn movie. 
And that's what these last three movies have been. You can just turn your brain off. The movie will do the thinking for you, which is evident in Fallen Kingdom and Dominion when basically the start of the movie tells you everything you need to know. You don't really need to watch the previous movies. Just watch the last one and you'll know what's going on. And if you like Dominion, that's not a bad thing. When this movie first came out, I remember everyone was really annoyed at the critics hating it, but only the true Jurassic fans liked it. Rubbish! If you don't like it, you can be whatever. You can be a Jurassic fan, you can be a critic. You don't have to be a Jurassic fan to enjoy this movie. In fact, I would say if you're a Jurassic fan, you probably don't enjoy the movie that much. I'm not going to be wowed and I'm not going to enjoy the movie just because you bring back the old cast, especially when a lot of the time they don't do anything in the movie. There's a lot of things to enjoy, a lot of things to get from this movie. The whole motorbike chase scene works brilliantly. The fact there's no soundtrack played there at all and you just hear the guttural noise of the motorbike's engine as well as the breaths of the atrociraptors and them snapping really adds like this visceral feeling to the scene. It's obvious that a lot of effort went into this movie. It just wasn't what I was expecting. Were the original cast there? Yeah. Did they live up to my expectation? No. <laughs> no, they did not. But you know, were they ever going to live up to my expectation? This is universal. This is the company that has canned games in the past just because they wouldn't make a profit. Not because the Jurassic fans don't want these games or movies or whatever, but because they don't think it's the most financially beneficial way to go about it. This franchise has been kept alive by the fan base. For example, Jurassic Outpost. They have been Colin Trevorrow's go-to people for him to ask about what to be in the movie or what to be included. The Dino Tracker website, for instance. You know, the website where you would see all around the world where different dinosaurs had been spotted. That was created not by Universal, but by Jurassic fans. And they had to fight tooth and nail for it. And what was Universal's input for that? Put in TikTokers, put in the most viral people, put their links to social media in there. But I'm in that website, not because Universal reached out to me. That was the Jurassic fans who made it. I was a bit worried that having me in the website would break the immersion in a way. However, I found a TikToker performing bloody magic in front of a Sinoceratops. So I guess I had nothing to worry about then. And let's be honest, they probably paid these people to be part of the website as well, judging by the hashtag Universal partner. Universal is happy to work with TikTokers and influencers that have nothing to do with the Jurassic franchise. But a channel like like mine that's been dedicated to dinosaurs and the Jurassic franchise for years, uh, they don't care about. You know, I've wanted to do this because I wanted to do this. This wasn't Universal asking me to, but I can't ignore the fact that they've been getting basically free advertising for their games, franchises, and movies. And yet this whole time I've been making content, I have never once been contacted by Universal. Not once. And it kind of sucks. I can't sit here and say that it doesn't. It just feels like that along with everything else, just shows that Universal's heart in this franchise is just not really there. Oh, so I know I am super late to this, and I imagine that this video is really long. It's already been like two and a half hours of just recording the audio, so I'm expecting the video to be over an hour. But anyway, I just wanted to get my thoughts out there, and you know, this is how I feel right now. Like, at the time, maybe in a couple of years' time, my views will change on this movie, but I, I really don't think so. <laughs> I just want to say thank you um, for supporting me the whole way through this. And hopefully I don't get copyright claimed on this video as well. Fun fact, uh, while editing this video, I am now fighting constant ID claims from Universal. Even though this falls under fair use, I'm probably not going to make a penny from this video because all the money this video makes is going to go towards them. Gotta love covering this franchise, man. <laughs> Fingers crossed, please Universal. It's fair use, it's transformative, it's a review. So I just want to say thank you for sticking with this video for the whole duration of it. Good God, you're a trooper. So if you've enjoyed this video, guys, leave a like. And until next time, where I won't be seeing you in another Jurassic World Dominion review, I'll see you later. Oh, bye-bye.